All right, I think we've got everyone in that we can fit in right now. This is great. This is wonderful. This is the largest crowd for Pulse in a couple of years. So uh, anyway, welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming out for the opening night. This is our 12th year for the Pulse Art and Technology Festival here at Telfer Museum's Jepson Center. I'm Harry DeLorme. I am the Senior Curator of Education and I'm also uh, allowed uh, by some very indulgent folks like my director Lisa Grove and our curators to do things like this and uh, we've got a lot of great staff who work very hard to get the exhibitions um, ready tonight. So again, welcome everyone to the 2018 edition of Pulse. Um, we're, uh, we're really excited this year. We have a lot of, of great projects, uh, interactive works, virtual reality experiences that you can try tonight and throughout the week. Um, before I get into tonight's program, I'd like to recognize some of the sponsors who have made uh, Pulse possible. In particular, I'd like to thank the city of Savannah for its ongoing investment in our programs here at Telford Museums. We could not do this uh, without the city's support, without the support of the city's taxpayers. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the festival, uh, the remainder of the festival, daytime hours, and uh, tomorrow night's program, this coming weekend, are free admission to Savannians, to Chatham County residents, and to all students. So uh, that's something that we feel is a very important part of this festival, really trying to make it open and available to everybody. I'd also like to thank um, Infinity for joining us as a new sponsor this year, and of course our longtime uh, media sponsor, Connect, as well. And uh, also our local partners who have really helped us out this year, including Codebase, Project MQ, Open Savannah, The Creative Coast, uh, Aaron Wessling, uh, some really great folks who have really partnered with us this year to do some great programming. I'm going to tell you about in just a second. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> moving on, we're very pleased to have us with us tonight, four artists sitting on the stage here. They kindly gave up their seats in the audience so we could get a few more people in. Um, we're happy to have them here tonight, and I'm going to start off by introducing uh, the artist who created Radiance, um, Terry Arbor, Max Almy, uh, are, have been working collaboratively for many years. They are <laughs> Emmy, AFI, NEA, and, AR, and Ars Electronica award-winning and internationally exhibited new media artist. Um, their complex installations, like the one you see upstairs, com seamlessly combine video, interactive media, constructed surfaces, painting, digital imagery, flat screens, and video projection. They're these really beautifully layered uh, works, um, which I hope you, you uh, will have a chance to see right after the program tonight. Um, they're very, uh, they're they're very mandala-like. Uh, they're based on sacred geometry, uh, and uh, they they tend to create a really beautiful uh, meditative experience in the gallery. So I'm going to first ask uh, them to come up. Uh, joining them in just a, a moment later will be Josephine Leong. Josephine is a programmer, technologist, and professor of interactive design uh, and game development at Savannah College of Art and Design, and she has a background in artificial intelligence, information systems, and micro microprocessor applications, and she's. Uh, She's actually a mainstay of Pulse as well because her student work um, is really phenomenal and we've, we have uh, featured that for several years now. Uh, so she's really become a, a staple of, of Pulse through the work of her students and we're pleased to have her as an artist this year. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Jacob just before he comes up. But first I want to uh, invite Max and Terry up on stage, up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Hello, Savannah. <laughs> I have to say that we moved here about a year and a half ago and we love Savannah and we have been so embraced by the community, we've made so many great friends and we've uh, had wonderful opportunities like this. So um, I'm, we're really delighted to be here. We're both at SCAD, we're both having a blast uh, t teaching there and working there. and. Um, with that, we're going to go into the way, way back machine and look at a piece, a couple of pieces that kind of lead us up to what you're seeing in the gallery today. So, oh, here we are. Okay. Um, let's see if I can do this. Hit return. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is an interesting, interesting one to start with because it's a, it's a collaboration that we did back in the 90s. And this was actually a big award-winning piece at Ars Electronica. It's, it's kind of like this giant art and technology show that has gotten tremendously big. And we, uh, at that time, we... Uh, it stars Rachel Rosenthal, who's a really well-known performance artist. Um, uh, she was declared a national treasure. She's really, a, really an amazing artist. Anyway, we were lucky enough to work with her. And uh, we created, in that 
at that time, a inter an interactive CD project. We were working on commercial projects with um, Philips Interactive and of course late at night we got together with people and we worked on more arty stuff. And so this one is actually a interactive game that is um, uh, about the environment and it's kind of a critique of um, the modern uh, living, modern consumerism, and, and uh, the impact on the environment. And what made this kind of extraordinary is that you got to choose your selections by shooting them off the screen with a gun. And, <laughs> and the gun was so popular that we had to replace it. It was it practically melted. <laughs> <laughs> so, but so you were in complicity with the problem. I, I'm going to play just a little bit of it. I mean, this was a very early interactive piece on CD, believe it or not. And um, CD, 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 inter CD Interactive, it's yeah. a format so, that doesn't exist anymore. Now let's see if I can get this to play. Um, we were having here, a over here. Oops, right okay, the right there. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a glimpse of it because... Although we need a little more audio. No, no, she's going to adjust it. It's, it, it slowly starts up. But you'll get a sense of kind of this... What do you want? What do you want? Eliminate one. Read the directions. Follow the rules. Start now. Eliminate one. Okay, I think you get the idea, but uh, but that, but it was a, a fun, a very interesting piece to do, and it, of course uh, there were a lot more elements in the installation. But that was, you know, that was working with interactivity and working with a great performance artist um, to do this statement about the environment. Um, the next piece that we're going to just show you was another kind of multi-part installation with lots of different media, <coughs> multimedia, and, and it starred the Borg Queen. I don't know how many people here are Trekkie fans, but this starred Alice Krieg, who is the Borg Queen, and she was a curator of a museum in the future, and we're looking back at things that no longer exist. Um, and this piece came out of uh, our involvement with a, uh, a wolf biologist, a woman who was writing about the species of wolves, and, um, and we found that the wolf was a great um, example of things that were Disappearing. Disappearing. So, and the, so the theme was that you're in the future, you're in this museum exhibit, letting you see species that have all disappeared. So, but we're showing you this because this is when Max and I started to use projection on paintings. So we were trying to extend the frame. It wasn't, it wasn't enough to do a static still image. We wanted to move things across the painting and so extend it into the fourth dimension. In this particular one, that the little wolf ran across, and then all this series of, of uh, um, disappeared species or uh, extinct species was uh, coming down on the third panel. So it was just a, a minor experiment to kind of play with the idea of projection, it, the intersection of the physical and the uh, media, basically digital media, and trying to see what could happen with that. So then this is a whoops, yeah. Here's another. She was the perfect Borg Queen curator of this moment in the future. Uh, at the pieces that we were doing at the time always had a bit of amusement to them, but they were also very much, you know, uh, had an edge of critique to them. Okay, so then. So this is a project that we did. Um, it was at the Gebert Gallery in Venice, California, and it's called Ascent. And we took the idea of extending the painting and making them larger and making them extend into space. So the image on the left is a two-story visualization of what this looked like. And we're going to play you a little of it in a second. But the paintings were seven feet high. And then on top of it, we registered these wings that just kind of took off. I'll just play a little of it if I can get it going here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very slow moving. 
but we are uh, in the gallery. You can tell them how it was when. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you a couple of things that had happened. We had lived through a gigantic fire in California and 52 homes burnt to the ground. <laughs> and it really had an impact on our work. And we would walk through these parched areas and um, the birds would kind of dive bomb us. And, and Max and I got this idea that we wanted to do pieces that were more uplifting about returning from the ashes. And so that's where this, this project came yeah, from. Yeah, this was part of a whole series of works. But when, when the paintings would move at night in front of the, in the, in the window of the gallery, cars would practically crash. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everything we, we put up in that gallery had some sort of movement to it. And actually, people would look in the gallery and the cars were having a terrible time going in front of the gallery because we, they could see it. But we did have a, an issue that people wanted to see these by the light of day. Now, if you do projection art, you do art by night, art in a dark space, but people wanted to see, can you do, can you give us a projection in our backyard? I'm having a pool party. <laughs> so, so Max and I got this idea that we wanted to make works that were emanating, that the light came through it. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, the copper patinaed work started. Um, what we're looking at here is Lotus, which is upstairs um, in the Lewis Gallery. And Lotus is, this is torch, torch patina, where I heat up a blowtorch and all the color comes out. Copper is a, an amazing material. And this was digitally water jet cut, so it went to a machine shop, then cut this pattern through it so that we could put an LED. Yeah, there's, and then there's two more le levels of patterning and movement that happen. We, we started playing with this idea of putting an LED screen behind something and putting the imagery uh, go, uh, the imagery going through you know intricate patterns so that we could create this this intricate movement and intri intricate patterning and so that was our first idea to put something through the pattern have a beautiful surface and then add e yet another layer of video to it to really make it that much more complex and and interesting and have the light emanate through it so we, we started out rather simply with some just little cut out things and, and then we just kind of started making, adding more and more layers to it. More but and more But when you pattern. start working with copper, it's quite addictive. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's a beautiful surface. It's very transformative. And this is um, lapis and this is a piece that this patina has a um, salt on it. And then I would wrap it up and bury it in the earth for like 24 hours and they never came out the same. Um, so and she's then this. A, she's a master of copper patina. <laughs> I don't know point. about that. But anyways, you can see this upstairs too. This is la lapis. And mm -hmm. I don't and know. And again, you know, using the pattern in the copper, we could put in, hide a little, a big LED screen behind it. The imagery could come through the intricate patterning and then add even more patterning on top of it. Okay. Uh, this was and then par also part of the series, and you can see this upstairs, this is a piece of lucite. Um, and what we're using on this is it has this nanotechnology film. And what that does is there's like little molecules in the paper that when you project on it, it just harnesses the light and becomes a surface that bounces the light back out. So Max and I are all about wanting to radiate the light, <laughs> radiance, yeah. So this piece is upstairs too, this is called White Tara. But it's typical of us over the decades, really, of always wanting to work with kind of new ideas and, and really elaborate technology and new technology. So, when, you know, we were investigating the surface that was designed by, by scientists and could create a brilliance. And so that's, that's the kind of thing we really like to, to utilize. And also, as I was saying, it's the intersection of the physical and then the the media uh, and see what happens. Okay. Oh, yes. So this this is kind this of like just run it. Yeah. yeah, I'll run this. This is um, well, this is motion activated. So the so the piece was a almost like a doorway. It was um, three feet by seven feet with with an LED behind it. And when you walked up to it in motion, it triggered all these projections. So this is called vibrant portal. It was based on some ideas about. Uh, quantum physics and that matter is is vibrant and it's emanating and it's everything is full of this fantastic energy. You can just see that when you in the gallery when you walk up there might be nothing emanating but then when you walk up and make a movement things would just pour out of it and a lot of people really had a lot of fun with this these particular works so 
This piece ended up in the Santa Fe um, hospital. It's in the lobby. Um, and a lot of people, when they're going in for CAT scans and heart procedures, really like to sit with it. In, in the hospital situation, it doesn't have the projection because there's so much light. But, but, I, but I think one of the things that we, that we had noticed over quite a few pieces was that people would, would sit with them and really s sometimes stay there for a really long time because they just had an eminence. So um, we came to the conclusion, just like right before we came to, Santa, uh, to Savannah, that we wanted to do an, a VR piece and that we wanted to somehow be inside of the work. Um, this is a, this is, these are some random shots of people just kind of having a really good time in front of that last piece. <laughs> yeah. And that's where we got this idea of what if we, what if we found an art form that could put people inside yes. these pieces, yeah. really yeah. make it more personal, like you could have your own little portal, if you will. And then we met Josephine and we uh, decided we could all work together and explore this idea. So. Um, why don't you hit the... Terry did a mock-up of what we were after. And that was the idea of what do we want this experience to be like. I had seen, we, we've looked at a million VR things. Terry teaches VR and I'm a great enthusiast of AR and VR. And we're early adopters. <laughs> <laughs> and I had seen a lot of interesting artworks where um, you could actually get outside of the artwork and walk around it and things like that. And I thought, what? If we created something you're inside of, that's cool right there. But this, but this, in, this view would be if you move the camera way outside of the experience and look back at it. And we can actually do that in Unity. But we, are, we chose to create this work that you were actually inside of. With so, we, so we took one you. of the sacred patterns, if you mm -hmm. will, um, that's, that's repetitive through the pieces upstairs. And we used it with Josephine's help to emit all these particles. So here's an early storyboard for what's going to happen, um, where you're going to stand there, it's going to form, and then it's going to start to pour down on you. And hopefully by having it pour down on you, you're going to feel good. It's kind of cool to stand right in the middle and yeah. watch it come down, and then, and then it de we did choreograph it. We made it come down, and then it raises up, and then it kind of just blasts off. So but as it comes down, it forms, it's kind of like as above, so below. As it's pouring down and you look down at your feet, the same thing is being formed, um, well Josephine can tell you about it, but it's being formed by a particle and it forms the same thing, only it's being formed procedurally. Yes. Okay, so I think it's time for Josephine to come up and explain how she brilliantly interpreted the ideas and added a lot of creativity to them at the same time. And these are a couple of stills from inside the VR experience. Stay here. Stay here? Okay. <laughs> you can All right, so I'm just um, going to talk about some of the um, tools that we use to build this experience. Um, Terry and, and Max would create the assets using Photoshop and After Effects. Mm -hmm. Not sure how familiar everybody is with this. I see a lot of students in the crowd, a lot of my students too. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the imagery, the videos that you see um, that we use in the piece are created using tools, um, you know, the two tools up there, Photoshop and and After Effects. And we use a tool called um, Unity to create this experience. Now Unity is um, a very, one of the very popular, popularly used game engines actually that um, a lot of people use to develop and build for, um, video games. So we, we did a lot of, um, we had to, um, when Terry and Max first came to me with this idea, uh, we kind of toyed around with different possibilities. We looked at tools and we finally settled on using Unity because we felt it would give us um, the control that we needed uh, in order to create the experience. So with, with coding, and, and they were talking about um, how you create a piece like that and looking at the, the Lotus piece, which is um, <laughs> the, the main element that you see. So the first thing was no, no, not yet. Okay. <laughs> One minute. Yeah, so it's how do you break it down when it comes to programming? Now, girls can code, okay? Remember that. <laughs> um, you want to break the problem down into parts so that you can repetitively, you know, build the, um, 
the shape of the lotus without having to, you know, draw it manually, right? So um, it all starts with a circle or part of a circle there. So you'll see in a little bit, we've got a little movie that will play that kind of shows you how this is formed. So of course I have, a, I had to put the parametric equation for the circle up there. It's, like, you know, <laughs> the math geek thing, so. <laughs> so let's see, so see that's how the lotus is formed. If you take a bunch of parts of a circle and you kind of rotate it around, eventually you, you get a lotus. And there you are. That's the lotus. <laughs> so, so having that as a basis, the next step would be to then, you know, and you can see on the right, that's, that's this code in Unity. It's uh, written in C sharp for those of you who are more technically oriented. So basically now having the lotus shape, we were then able to um, create the light particles along the arcs of the lotuses uh, that was formed and in order to in the beginning, we, we tried a lot of, uh, we, we did a whole bunch of experiments and tried to use the particle systems that are in Unity. So those, those of you who are familiar with Unity know what I'm talking about. Um, it w did not give us the kind of control that we wanted because you just get like rain coming down, you know, without any specific pattern. So in order to do it and have the control, in order to build, build the aesthetic that was um, what uh, they had conceived in, in the storyboards that you saw, um, we did everything, I, you know, I had to write everything in code, so that's how I can tell you that exactly 5,120 uh, 5, light particles that fall down on you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so again, you know, using, using code allowed us to actually control the behavior of the light particles, how they would fall, how they formed, and then how they would emerge. So everything was done, you know, by writing code, so every light particle has its own behavior and um, the code tells it what to do. And that allowed us to tweak it and, and you know, change the timing and everything else. So um, again, you know, a script was used, code was used to control the sequencing as well. So because those of you who, who work with tools like um, After Effects that have a timeline, this was not done using a timeline. <laughs> it's all done in code. So um, if that, that, I'm going to stop here with all the technical stuff, so if you have anything else, we will have a Q&A at the end. If you have more questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to shift over now to our second presentation by Jacob Steenson. And so, uh, let's see, we're going to swap out a laptop and uh, get some other things going. In the meantime, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Jacob. Um, Jacob is a Danish-born born artist and art director based in New York. He specializes in VR and real-time virtual simulations of ecosystems. And he's concerned with how imagination, technology, and ecology intertwine by, develop by developing futuristic virtual simulations of existing real-world landscapes. Um, this is something you'll see uh, throughout his work. But uh, uh, I was really struck by an earlier piece that I saw uh, in 2017, uh, one of these uh, environments that he created. Which was really interesting, and they're, they're always. Uh, if you could talk more about this, I'm not sure if you would describe them as dystopian. They seem always seem a little. I think they're more romantic or something. More romantic, like, like nature, or... uh, romanticism. Okay, so, so all right. Well, I'll, I'll let I'll let you uh, I'll let you elaborate on that in just uh, in just a moment. But uh, but as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Jacob is really at the forefront of working with these kinds of virtual environments and creating these incredibly beautiful, um, detailed um, scenarios. Uh, his work occupies a space um, between art, science, and 3D studio production models, which is another thing I think that's really fascinating about his work. Jacob has exhibited uh, widely, uh, including uh, at Times Square, uh, the Midnight Moment um, um, project, uh, at the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Moving Image Art Fair, the Museum of Modern Art Maxi Wired's annual conference, Freeze in London, uh, OK Corral in Copenhagen, uh, and uh, at the London Science Museum. As an art director on the VR project three, uh, Tree VR, made with the Rainforest Alliance and New Reality Company, he's also shown his work at Sundance and Tribeca Film Festivals. His work has also been featured widely in media, including Artnet, The Art Newspaper, Hyperallergic, Spike Art Quarterly, Art Report, 
information, Wired, and many others. He's received awards from the Danish Arts Foundation, the Augustinus Foundation, and the Lumen Art Prize. He's also been a residence and artist in residence at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, uh, and he is currently a 2017-2018 member of New Inc. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, uh, but it's a uh, technology and culture incubator um, operated by the New Museum in New York City. So we're going to switch out his laptop. In the meantime, please welcome Jacob Steenson. Hello, my name is Jacob. Um, thank you for that presentation, Harry. Let me just get my presentation up. Here it is. Oh, sorry, one back. Yeah, so as I said, I've been kind of working with three concepts for about five years, which is imagination, technology, and ecology. So when I grew up, I was playing a lot of computer games. And then I started modifying these computer games that a lot of my friends today, they're making big blockbuster kind of first person shooters, but I went the opposite direction, went into fine arts, but I really respect the crafts and the dedication and the, this, uh, this whole process of making work where you first go to actual landscapes, you, you research the, some histories, you make drawings of it, sketches, video it, uh, speak with people and everything, and then from those, from that kind of source information, built an alternative world and scenario. So while I have a lot of friends, they built these big first person shooter games, I'm building these alternative imaginations of the future and most often they're built through collaborations with NGOs or residencies or museums or tech companies. So as an artist as well, you also, you know, I also have to eat. So this type of work is not that popular in the more conventional gallery context. So what I start to explore more is relationships with these companies. So I've developed a practice where my work um, is also technologically at the forefront of what's possible for what's called real-time simulations and rendering. So just like the project before, there's a lot of physics in it, um, but also how you use different types of lighting and textures um, and all these kind of things. And the past two years, I've mainly been focusing on VR, so I don't know if, how many people here have tried it, but the pictures I show on the videos, some of it is also shown as video installations and different things, but the core of the pieces are big landscapes. Sometimes they're virtually many kilometers. Like I built a virtual island I will show that's <clears throat> four times four kilometer large, so it would take you several hours to walk around it. Uh, I'm showing a piece up here called Aquaphobia. I'll go through it here as well. That's a full-scale replica of a park in Brooklyn. Um, so that's about 200 meters, but you also go underground and through some tunnels and above ground. Um, here are a few pieces I've done the past year and I am just trying to see how much they interest you and then go through as many as I can before the time runs out. <laughs> um, that's usually how I present. I just go up here and speak. Um, so this is called Pando Endo. This is a virtual plant. Oh, no, we can't show up the light. Um, so Pando is an actual a clonal colony of aspen trees and it's the largest in the world. It's one organism that's 80,000 years old and it covers an entire mountain range. And Endo is this play with the old, old etymology of uh, infrastructures. So I went and photographed the, the yeah, you can't see that well because of the light. But um, uh, is it possible to turn, is it too complicated? Yeah, then? Our sign interpreter might need to scoot closer to you. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll show a video. We can probably see it. So I went and took photographs of the, the roots, the moss, and the textures of many of these trees. And then I layer them and sample them together. And then I built a program that uh, took these textures and then it built a root. It's, there's a whole organism. You can see it in, here in the beginning. This is the entire thing. I built virtually small glass boxes and the middle one has a seed and then I tell the program basically it'd like to break out of that box and it'd like to grow towards the most light intensive areas in a, in a 360 photograph. So it's kind of like a sphere photograph of an abandoned exhibition hall. And then the, the program built this root for me. So it has this weird look of kind of me deciding where the textures go, uh, but they're also procedurally generated so they're kind of random. The computer builds it for me. Um, oh, let me just give you guys audio. I have to put this in. 
Uh, one second. Should there be audio now? So, this is a recording from one drone. I'll just pick up. Yeah, so this is um, what you see here are these drones and each of them has a virtual camera attached to it. And then when you have a headset on, you're inside this drone and then you can swap between the different um, camera perspectives and then dynamically go through this uh, plant because it's about two kilometers big. So it's, it's very hard to present on a screen how large it is in, in virtual space. Um, yeah, and so this is the piece I'm presenting upstairs. Let me just see. Called Aquaphobia that I made last year. Um, it's a full scale replica of this park in Brooklyn. And the way I made this work was that there was a kind of competition by the mayor's office in New York. And the open call was on climate change in an area of Brooklyn called Red Hook. So I researched the landscape history and the, the past species and soil types that were in this landscape. And then I built the entire park. In, um, so it has the pier and everything, but all the species and the soil types are from before there was a city. But the infrastructure of the park is still in the, in the virtual wor version of it. Um, yeah, so this is something I find really fascinating with VR. Uh, when you're working with real organic material and places, like I go photograph rocks, I order this past um, soil that was in Red Hook before, it's a red type of clay. So I order that to my studio and then I photograph it and then I throw it into the virtual world as the textures you see. So there's a very close connection to reality and photo photography and the different species. And then what you can do in VR when you just allow people to explore these spaces is that literally in a, in a sense you can really combine different periods in time and let people just walk around in it. Usually my work doesn't, aquaphobia has to some extent a kind of linear narrative of seven minutes, you walk through a landscape, but all my other work, they are just big landscapes and it's up to you to walk around. So I think of it more as an actual virtual space that you can explore, um, or like an art installation or a piece of architecture. Um, and something else I find really interesting is that you can kind of personify different species or organisms. That's something I work a lot with too. It's removing, it's still created by me as a human, so there's a clear human perspective in it, but I'm trying to remove our understanding of what it means to kind of divide ecology and landscapes and humans. So in aquaphobia, there's a water microbe in the beginning, and it grows and moves through the landscape, and as you follow it, it tells this kind of poem in five stages of how you broke up. So it's a metaphor of breaking up with a landscape, but it's kind of a person at the same time. And then the landscape has these five levels in it that you just naturally move through. And each of those five parts of the landscape in the poem is based on an interview I did with a scientist in New York who are actually treating people for, aqua for aquaphobia and how they try to change your perception. So I try to create a landscape that has those type of reflections as well. So you, you, you kind of go through these, um, from microbes and through these tunnels and yeah, that used to be a deer. So sometimes I also just throw in stuff quite intuitively and imaginatively. I like those, I think those elements, and that's also what I'm in, in the production or in, in the introduction. I have a lot of friends, they work, you know, under huge many million dollar production, they're like 50 people, everything. And then you're really, it's quite limited how much you can just do things as, as you'd like, but when you're as an artist, there's a certain freedom to that. So a big thing that I value in my work is just to show that it's possible as well to just really imagine and use technology to show those imaginations. Um, yeah, I think I've kind of talked about the real world locations, but that's an actual monument out in this park. 
not the gates, they're kind of my sci-fi take, but the actual thing in the middle. Um, yeah, like, um, this is a project I did in November for Times Square. Um, I'll just play this video and then I can talk about it. This is a recording of it. Um, so this is a project, it's, it's actually, it's the wrong date. It was developed between 2016 and 17, called Tyrannic Animism. Um, for that project, I was interested in past kind of imaginations in the states that were quite strong for the World's Fest in New York that were in the 60s. The idea of a future kind of utopian scenario where technology and infrastructures are fully harmonically intertwined. So I built a costume, you can see me. It's actually my wife, but she's down there. Um, and then I went and photographed this dome out in Queens, and this, this photograph is based on photographs from the 60s in the New York Times that wrote about this World Fair and contrasted it with actual, this utopian theme with the actual social circumstances and protests that were going on right outside the World Fair at the same time. So, Based on that, I was, for this piece, I drew a lot of random connections as well. But I went up to Mas Moka, I was artist in residence there. And then um, I created the replica of the, the kind of primordial forests that were in Northeast America. And then inside that forest, I positioned these uh, video screens like this and these photographs. And then you walk around inside of this forest with the headset on. And then for Times Square, they asked me to take this piece and then think about how it, the concept of VR could be translated into a public space. So I kind of, uh, all the video screens on Times Square for three minutes every day at midnight for the month, it would show this a tour through this landscape. Um, so the, the kind of, I'm, when I develop projects, it's mainly the thinking, uh, the concepts that drives it. Because this is a, with a headset on when you walk around the forest, but I think it might as well also show as a, public video installation and the concept of a virtual reality could be just as effective there. Uh, so this is me in the costume. Um, it's made of mylar. It's the same material you use for on satellites and for space suits. So I took an old winter ski jacket and dressed myself in it. And then I walked around this forest for a month and filmed myself in it and then recreated scenes from it and then made that, uh, that piece. Uh, this is an old school bus to remain on that theme of infrastructures and ecology that I found um, just smashed on the, by, the, by the road and then I built a kind of kitschy spaceship out of it so there's, this, there's also a video scene inside it. Um, and then those are shown as video screens inside the forest and they move around as you move around. Uh, it's, 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 it's still pretty challenging to translate this kind of work to a two-dimensional paradigm or screen. Um, some more, this, so that's, so for example, I took photographs of the mylar in my studio and then translated it to virtual textures. That's a general thing I use a lot. Um, oh, let me just see. I think this should be a video. I might just play a little bit of this. But that's, so that's inside the forest to walk around in. And you're just using your own body to move. Um, and you can teleport too. It's pretty cool about VR. So that's some of that imaginary stuff I just come up with. So that's the bus.
So it's quite general for a lot of my projects that I spend four to six months building each of them and then try to find partnerships. First I make a small demo and then I try to find museums or partnerships and develop it further. So that's inside the, the bus. Um, yeah, so that screen would be in the forest that you walk around in. Um, so this is, um, let me just show an image first. This is a project I did at Bemis Art Center. Um, it's a virtual island, it's four times four kilometers and it's built first from the satellite images of it. It's a quite general techniques used in a lot of computer games too. You get this data of the landscape's height and then you translate it and it gives you a 3D model. And then it's a matter of how do you populate and what do you do with that model. So what I did was, was that I looked at um, different historical drawings of this island. So this is from an explorer who went there in the 1700s. And then I fill in my own like tourist sci-fi stuff in this. But it's, it's fully inspired by these drawings. And then I also took uh, tourist photographs. I looked at, I've never been to this island. I was just interested in the fantasy of this island. It's Bora Bora in French Polynesia. So that's a very popular luxury American tourist attraction, but there's a lot of ethical considerations about that, I think. So this is a tourist who went with his wife and then they photographed the actual buildings, the workers and all the resorts live in. And most of the workers, workers are the native descendants of the Tiki Tiki and then they work in French luxury hotels for American tourists on this island. So there's a whole story about this in the, in the landscape when you walk around it. Um, there's a hint of an airport that I make kind of sci-fi, but its location and everything is based on an American base uh, during the Second World War that was on the island. Um, and then there's just some trails. So when you walk through it, you can, you can, you can walk through these trails or up the bushes or what you want to do. Um, yeah. Are we, how are we on time? Oh, okay, cool. So this is something I made with uh, something called Disc Magazine and a 3D company called Scatter. Scatter is a very successful VR company. They have a lot of published projects. They've developed this video 3D technology that you take a video camera through a space and then that translate that into a 3D model. So it's no longer just photography, but you can film people and everything. And it's one of the leading companies doing it. So they asked me to do an art project for um, with, the, with the other artists, there was a group show for Carnegie Museum of Art. And then this collective in New York called Disc Magazine gave me this text I had to interpret, which was about climate wars. So I researched the um, future sketches from Amazon offices. Because so, you know, there's so much drought in the West Coast and everything, and there are all these utopian tech startup fantasies. Um, and then I took those photos and de developed that dome that you're inside of, and then Inside of it, there are these uh, barriers and walls and different things between these luxury villas that you, c you can't enter them. And then you're in a position in this um, little spot with some trash and different things around. Um, I did a project some years ago where I was, I'm not gonna talk about that project today, but um, I explored abandoned resorts for two months in Spain. And this horse you see down here is a recording of a horse that lived in an abandoned uh, resort and then the locals use it as a kind of place to live. Um, just, it was only take 15 seconds then. But this is a project that I did in 2015. So these two video screens, and then I drove for two months around and explored these resorts, and I made this. I just put two cameras in a car, and then I slept in a tent in these places, just these small cameras, and then I used After Effects to look like this kitschy sci-fi computer game thing to make it look kind of high-tech, but it's all super low-tech, and it's just me and my own with a with a camera and uh, this is for example a rabbit that lived in a so it's with a zoom lens so I lie down and then film it from afar um, but he was living in an abandoned airport that's been used once um, this is a imported palm tree um, and then down to the right you see this destination coordinates so those are the coordinates of each image on the second screen and the second screen shows these close-ups and the left screen shows the this is just from the car but then I just try and use the effect so it looks kind of virtual um, and then I retraced the whole thing from Google after and just played it like a computer game with the keyboard and then recorded the trip I went on with the car like this little arrow um, 
Oh yeah, just the last thing. This is interesting. This is a palm tree from California, um, where they're grown, and in Egypt, and they've become invasive to this whole area in southern Europe. So they've almost been wiping out all the palm trees there. So most places you go to resorts and everything, all these species are they're grown somewhere else, and then they're imported to make places look like you would like them to look. When you go to resorts in Florida, and California, and Spain, wherever, most of the trees are made in e Egypt and in California. Uh, yeah, so that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. Uh, we only have uh, a few minutes. We've, we can take about 15 minutes for questions, uh, and then I'll let you get to the reception and the performance. So uh, if you have questions to ask of any of our panelists, uh, just raise your hand, and we'll try to get to a few of those tonight. So yes, to start. Did, did everyone hear the question? No. So the question was about the sound that Jacob used for aquaphobia and the mixing of the sound. So I if you could. Yeah, is that, is that microphone here? Can you hear me? Yeah, so the sounds are made in several different ways depending on how much I want to comment on some kind of fantasy of a landscape or a real landscape. So aquaphobia, there's, a, there's the water organism. I work with a young author who is, who is speaking as it from New York. And then there are actual scuba diving sounds from people who are recording themselves and showing themselves, like kind of selfie scuba diving on YouTube. But then the environmental sounds are me using these uh, small microphones in the landscape and going there and then recording it. And then I create like virtual physics for the sound so it can bounce off walls and things. Um, and it, it exists in kind of a three-dimensional space. So if you move close to it, it's louder. If you move further away, it's is less loud. Um, yeah, so it's a mixture of it. Yeah. Sometimes I use soundscapes that are su like super stylized and I pay someone who makes that for a game or something to make a hyper stylized fantasy sound of a forest. So for the, the one I did with the forest, that's one of the soundscapes is made like that and what, like of wind and things. But then I also just found a cow, and he was making this cool noise, so I recorded it and threw it in there. So, yeah. Great. There are questions? Come on, y'all. It's your chance. Sorry, up here. You said that for aquaphobia, you like research aquaphobia and then mimic the concept of the stages. Can you like explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So at least you know there are probably many different methods for it, but. The one I spoke with her method is that the first step is to rethink what water is. So she speaks to the patient of uh, what's the physics of water, what's in water, it's kind of alive, it's a thing, it's not this alien element. And then the second one is that then she takes them and she dips their toes into water. So in my piece, the first room is what the, the microbes, like they're actual ele electron, mic um, electron microscope images. And they're on these three walls around you. Um, and then in the next room, the, the, the ground resembles a little more like infrastructures we know, and it's very muddy and wet. And then the water bubble tells you to uh, look down at your feet. You're sinking an inch into the mud. But it's all, you're not, you know, you're not sinking anywhere really. It, but yeah, so I try to translate all those steps. So the final scene, you're over the water on a bridge, and the water bubble is telling you, like, learn to swim. And that's the end of the breakup story as well. It's sort of, you have to learn to swim now. And, uh, and then it, it becomes this huge, huge, massive, massive bubble. Um, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Anyone else? Yep. Of a comment from the Max. You blew my mind because when I think of VR, I think of video games and killing people virtually. <laughs> So maybe you can just comment because what I saw here and what I'm looking forward to seeing is, is something so feminine and almost spiritual. So maybe, I don't know if that's if you're out there all by yourself or if this is just something I'm excited to see for the first time. 
Well, we could talk the whole evening about this. You know, there's a whole movement in VR for using it for good. Um, and right now, you know, gaming has, has a lot of attention on it, but there's also VR being used in medical applications, VR use, being used in industrial applications, art applications, interior design. Mm -hmm. um, Almost everything you can think of it's expanding into. But in terms of the content that you're addressing, it's been something that we've been exploring for quite a while. Uh, we went from more content-rich pieces that were semi-narrative and, you know, uh, uh, interesting and kind of uh, Im uh, amusing, social amusing social satire. And then we moved, we've moved more into just, uh, you know, creating beauty, create, working with patterns, working with. Um, I iconography that is actually goes way back in history and comes right up to the moment uh, in science and so therefore it's stuff that I think we feel in our in our DNA um, when you see the same patterns arising from 3,000 years ago and coming up in a um, scientific experiment it's it's an amazing thing so we're, we're really interested in that and um, working with that kind of iconography and even though uh, we're layering things and doing all this stuff, we're really, we really love that kind of imagery. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Here. Continue on that question. Uh, when you went into doing this project, this last project, uh, what were the things that you had, it, uh, what were your expectations, and what you ended up discovering in the process? We wanted, to, we wanted to create the sensation of being inside one of these light pieces that you'll, you'll see in the Lewis Gallery. Um, that was where we started. It seemed really important to make, an, um, to make it even more immersive. I mean, I think our work has, has had an immersive quality, you know, given the fact that people want to sit in front of them and, you know, have the light hit them and take selfies in front of them with the light projected on them. But we wanted to take it beyond that and put people inside that experience and shower them with light and and that's what that's where the idea for radiance came i don't know if i answered your question yep the back that's true of the whole panel but i imagine working in these mediums you've already seen quite a bit of change mm -hmm. what do you expect in the future and what do you hope for well technologically i, I think um m better and better resolution more and more of a realistic experience as you look around. Um, just really wild imagination coming in from various artists. It's interesting, you know, there's the wonderful elaborate gaming, but then there's artists who do really, really personal, interesting investigations, you know. And like even Laurie Anderson, if you know who that is, uh, she came out with a VR piece that was a mind blower, very much related to her ongoing work, telling stories and being a poet and doing amazing performance art and things. But, you know, there's, I feel like there's going to be a lot of explosions that, where people come up with amazing new um, bursts forward in what's possible because the medium itself of being able to be inside something or to be in an AR experience where you're projecting something happening on the table in front of you or around you, um, it, there's just so much opportunity for creativity. Also, that. also, there's the nexus of the, the practical and the virtual, or the or the practical and the and the digital. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. There's there's the whole notion of theme parks where yeah. where where one experience blends seamlessly into another. Um, Disney's just opened a a whole series of experiences called the void where you can go into a, a Star Wars scenario and touch walls and the walls are part of the virtual world and mm -hmm. but they're also practical and so it mm -hmm. starts to become richer and more layered so it's not just virtual reality or augmented reality it's practical and mm -hmm. it, it's quite complex so mm -hmm. I think we're just going to see it's going to get better and better and easier and easier and yeah. less expensive mm -hmm. it's going to drive and the more cost down uh, more expanded around the world. I mean, everybody being involved in it. And, and I think uh, but the lovely part is, I mean, Terry and I have been commercial artists, digital designers for a long time, but we've also been artists the whole time doing artworks. And I think the, the idea is that uh, there's always those, those wonderful bursts forward that happen when people who really don't have a client or anything involved, and they do the thing personally uh, on their own. Yeah. And that's when things really 
go forward, you know, I think. Yeah, I think to me it's been exciting that um, all of a sudden I'm working with people from many different fields. So as, an, as Harry also mentioned, I've also worked as an art director. So that's like someone asked me to work on their project. So I, I would do maybe once of those a year. And then it's a bigger production. And on those, the people you work with, you know, some are very experienced programmers. They build big games. But some of them are totally new. They come from a science background, like what I did. I didn't show it here. But with the Rainforest Alliance, I had conversations with their scientists of the experience of going on expeditions, the type of soils they're working with and everything. And most people that I know working in VR professionally now, they're just all sorts of cross mixtures. And as an artist as well, I've never had commercial 3D studios asking to work with me before there was VR. <laughs> that's like, that's just a kind of new ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say like what it's gonna be because that's, that's what I appreciate about it right now is there's that an open ground for it. So you can do, try to find some people and just like jam it and do what you think it's good for. Yeah. Um, what I do hope is that, and what it, this is just my own personal preference, but in terms of the kind of market that's driven it right, driving it right now, some of the, you know, there are all these shooter games and everything and they make the companies money. But if you look at act, what people are actually experiencing, some of the things that are coming up that is being really well received is VR that has nothing to do with any of that. One of them is just this ridiculous thing where you fly around a flying car in this sci-fi city inspired by Blade Runner and that's nothing else. Mm -hmm. And everybody loves it who use it because I think a lot of the companies that went into it thought that the market only wanted these games but they're rapidly, uh, consumers I think are getting a little tired of it. So I think these like senders or art are different ways of using it that gives it from a, from the consumer perspective mm -hmm. uh, different uh, experiences that they could not have before is a, is the more unique approach. Mm -hmm. And also, you could find um, a lot more user generated content as it gets more mainstream. I think um, you see some pieces that were made by Terry students actually using mm -hmm. um, tilt brush, using quill, where you know you can actually go into these virtual environments and and make art and a lot more of that happening as well. Oh, I, just in general, I think um, all of us will be uh, working in virtual offices and designing things virtually and actually training and just doing so many things virtually that um, we just won't even I mean, take it for granted. Um, I think that's the way everything's moving right now, if you really yeah. want to know. Yep. Great. Well, last question. Yeah. Gary, you mentioned augmented reality. Hmm. What's the difference between augmented and virtual? That's a good question. Yeah. Virtual reality is when you have goggles and you're completely immersed. immersed. And augmented is you're, layer, you're layering, you're augmenting reality. It's mixed reality. You can see around you while you have glasses on, but um, so you have peripheral vision. But, but things, things are layered. And like, you can ha yeah, like information or, or games or all kinds of things. There's there's a really quick movement in augmented reality. If you play with Snapchat or if you're Pokemon, kids, Pokemon Go, Sna Snapchat. You've yeah. got a sensor in your Pokemon yeah. Go. Yeah. 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 And, you, and yeah. you've got a, a sensor in your camera, and your your camera knows exactly where you are, and you registers your face, and suddenly you have sunglasses that came out of nowhere or you have a nose or ears, that's, that's augmented reality. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. been here and now it's going to really um, take off. Take off. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Come and enjoy well, the show. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so thank you guys again so much. Please enjoy the show, talk to our artists. Please come back, more coming this week. <laughs>